I'm going to uh, not tell you about how successful um, uh, folks have been uh, in and around um, my center at Stanford or, or tell you about any of my successes. I'm actually going to tell you the mistakes I've made. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that'll be helpful to some, some folks. Uh, my conflict of interest by virtue of what I do at the Cath Lab and the uh, Core Lab at Stanford, some of the industry involvement, and then my venture experience in San Francisco as well as Tel Aviv, again, participating in the idea to bring concepts to patient uh, needs and thus integration. We've learned that this inventive process, as we see the tools over there on the left and we see anesthesiologists sitting next to engineers, the invention is not planned. The invention is always spontaneous. It's not taught. It's unpredictable. It often happens with young people that don't say no uh, very often. I'm too old. I say no right away. Um, you have to push the envelope. You have to not be afraid to fail. Get back on the branch every time. Restlessness helps. That's part of the reason I spend a lot of my life here is because there's a phenomenal amount of innovative folks uh, in, this, uh, in this small country. I think there's the three ring circus of success. Um, it's that invention, which is important, but then it's the innovation, call it PQ, that's preclinical intellectual property and prototyping. It's a very important part of the inventive process. That's what I call innovation. And of course, the biggest area that everybody fails is the execution part, because you've got to have experience and you've got to have capital. So this is the three ring circus, at least for me, with respect to medical device startups. And I'll tell you the formula for success, it's three things as well. It's luck, it's timing, and it's relationships. I've never seen anybody be able to not be lucky um, and not be at the right time and not have good relationships, especially now with the strategics, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Again, the formula one of a successful medical device startup is, uh, is formed by you know, two people sitting next to each other. Somebody that's technical and somebody that knows healthcare and knows that there's a problem. And throughout this whole process, you always have to be oriented, not only to the patient, but the overwhelming clinical need. And that need all, not only can change, but the integration of how you get to that need or get to that patient changes constantly. And we're seeing that in spades today, um, um, uh, certainly in the United States. When I started um, doing this medical device development in the late 80s, um, things were linear. The more time you spent in a medical device company, the um, more valuable it became. Now, device C might have been for a foot ulcer, and device A might have been targeting uh, diabetes, let's say, but today, it's absolutely bimodal. There is this abyss that everybody falls into, which requires more money, takes longer, and there's more risk. So there's two humps here. You either have an inflection point here, or you have an inflection point by getting accretive. And you get accretive, and if you're lucky, and you don't just have one product, and I can name a number of companies that are one product accretive companies, and they're in a destiny to get to fail, or they're a destiny, unless they roll up because we don't have an IPO market, to uh, not have their acquisition as robust as potentially the returns can be in this first hump. So let's look at this. The first hump, you have to know the market and the clinical integration. You have to know whose pipeline this is going to synergize. And you form those relationships. Remember, that's number three, timing lock, in relationships with those strategics. You're not only making things for patients, but in that first hump, you've got to be making them for portfolios. And if you're lucky enough early on to synergize with the strategic and make sure you keep your eye not only on the patient, but the portfolio, that's going to be very helpful. The second, you've got to be grown at 10 to 15 percent. Um, in order to get an accretive slope that somebody actually pays attention to. If you're just one product, you're very vulnerable. You've got to start rolling up um, when you're in this accretive issue. You've got to have multiple products. And you've got to not just think of the United States and Europe, you've got to think of China. And you've got to think of India. And you've got to think of Korea. And you've got to think of some of these other areas that are going to be very helpful. Let's talk about two, a tale of two companies. One is Pathway Medical, about a $2 billion market. The other is Barracks Medical, about a $2 billion market. The prevalence of getting cancer in this particular technology is 0.12% on an annual basis. You know what the probability of me getting hit by a car if I walk from here to Jaffu is 40 times? It's double the percentage. So this is a very, very low, and that was a New England Journal paper um, uh, three weeks ago. But let's talk about both these companies. They raised about the same amount of money, the one on the left, 90, the one on the right, 80. They've been in existence for 10 years. 
Um, the annual revenues from the one on the left was 30%. It was growing at 15%. That's pretty good. It's a one product company, remember. The one on the right, 30 million, growing at 12%. It's a one product company. And they were both acquired recently. One for five times revenues, Pathway, and the other for 10 times revenues. So what's the difference here? Why is Barracks, which has an annual risk of cancer, being 0.12% per year versus PAD, which lots of people have peripheral arterial disease, why is the one on the right get 10x revenue? China. China? A little bit, yeah. Competition? Huh? So, so one of the biggest reasons, it's emotion. People don't want to get cancer. People don't want to get cancer in the United States. You mentioned the C word, and there's a physician around that gets paid to do an instrumentation. This is where you get a value chain that can be amplified in a company like Covidian, uh, which isn't even really in this space. So, so, so when you're doing your devices, make sure you even look at what you're targeting. I'm not sure I'm necessarily proud of this, I'm just saying that this is how it basically turned out. And there is, a, there is an Asian component, too, that was smart with respect to uh, the company on the right. So things in the United States are changing drastically. We're seeing an FDA flip-flop between drugs that are approved to drugs that are black boxed. We're seeing a 510K pathway and a PMA pathway that is about as ambiguous as you possibly can. That's time and money. And we're seeing a huge conflict of interest issues um, that are really squeezing those at, um, at some of these uh, higher learning uh, uh, centers to, to, to innovate. So where are things going? Of course, once you squeeze the input, you squeeze the output, they go outside. I don't have to tell you about Ireland and Israel, but Taiwan, India, China, Singapore, South America, there's a plethora of innovation going on. I, unfortunately, I got to sit on a plane, but there's a plethora of innovation and execution going on globally. And now, no longer do we go to a fragmented Europe and get in line for the U.S. It's a whole different world, and we need to think about that with respect to medical devices. Just as a, as, a, um, as a sidebar, if you haven't read The Chinese Dream by Helen Wang, it's worth reading. Taiwan, for example, intense production and infrastructure production. Cost of goods is their middle name. They came up with the iPod 10 years ago. They just didn't have a guy with a black turtleneck marketing it. This is uh, incredible uh, prototyping. The system encourages first in man. They have universal health coverage. They have the strongest IPO for healthcare in the world, and they are the entree to China. They have the tax rule across the, uh, across the strait. There's 16 flights nonstop to go from the city airport every day into greater, uh, greater China. Japan companies, Korea companies are moving to Taiwan. It's something to pay attention to, for sure. Um, just a few facts about, uh, about China. There are 135 million people who have hep B positive. There are that's three times the United States. There are 263 million people over the age of 65. Due to the one child law, for the next 20 years, four parents, one child, and a spouse will be supported by one married man. And the average age over there is a 24 year old guy who has a building bank account that's got a cell phone in his hand. So there's going to be some significant integration through that IT for MT opportunities, especially there. There are 125 million that are true consumers of health care. They pay out of pocket. Um, for healthcare in the Beijing, China, uh, sh um, Shanghai's, and the um, and the Hong Kong's, they just banned smoking. Even though cigarette taxes it generates eight percent of their total revenue for the country, so they're doing some long-term thinking, not short-term uh, Congress type of uh, type of decisions. You got to look at the distributors there, from Weigao all the way to Mindray. They are looking aggressively for technology. You don't want to go in and set up shop in China, Medtronic. J&J, &J, they all have learned that lesson the hard way. But these folks are the next next to buy technology and bring it into China the way they bring it in. Distribution companies are looking namely in cardiovascular, ortho, and home care monitoring technologies. Again, getting back to this IT meets MT issues. And again, you form a subsidiary. It's Brand X Asia and a Chinese company which is affiliated with a government, gets the approval, protects the intellectual property. There were twice as many um, patent uh, litigations in China than there were in the United States last year. This is getting much better with respect to correct and IP. And again, I think you can have a return to investors by having this mode of operandi. So let's go back and talk about the basics, the anatomy of a startup company. We've heard the large clinical need is absolutely the foundation. 
One of the things that I um, have learned and gotten and made many mistakes on is, is the right team and the right people. If I'm the smartest one around the table, it's the wrong table. You have to surround yourself by smarter people. And, and if you don't, you're gonna be in trouble. And you have to change those people as your company matures. Commercialization is a lot different than innovation. And you have to change accordingly. And Farallon is, you know, a master at that. And she changed as, as time went on. And that was one of the successes for uh, eval. Because there's a ton of places to make mistakes. And I've carved my initials in just about every pothole from prototype to commercialization. So what I'd like to do is just, just take, a, take a minute and talk about a couple of them. Intellectual property, everybody makes a mistake on intellectual property. I had these patents, I thought they were great. Um, I didn't think anybody could get around them. In fact, the lawyers in the startup said, no, we think we can get around, we don't need them. What we didn't think about is what happens if St. Jude bought the one that we thought we could get around? Well, when I ended up transitioning this to, to J&J, &J, this is their closure device now, $18 million because of that IP risk was put in escrow because I thought my patent was good enough and I didn't need them. Just think the other way around. If you had it, would you like it? Or if somebody else had it, would you hate it? You can't just listen to the lawyers that you're paying that say, we can get around it because that just means they're gonna try to get around it and they're gonna charge it. So just be careful about that. I made that mistake and that was an $18 million mistake. The patent laws are definitely changing. We've gone over 8 million now. It's gone from the US system starting next year, the end of next year, first to invent, um, to first to file. That's gonna mean there's gonna be a lot of companies filing a bunch of interference patents. So you really wanna be disciplined, and I know Haim and other people have stressed this, in writing your, your invention down, making sure that it's signed, making sure that it's on, um, a paper that's paginated, making sure that it's documented. This is going to be very important, this first to file system. It's going to cause some clutter out there. So again, as a young innovator, inventor, you've got to think of this because that will change. One piece of advice I would give you is you go out and get this FTO, this freedom to operate, right? And you get this big high-priced lawyer from New York. That lawyer, who's 50, is no better than the 23-year-olds that are searching Google for some code words, and he or she gives you freedom to operate based upon what's on their desk, what the 23-year-old looked for. Do it yourself. There are a ton of these things around. USPTO, Google, Delphion. You can know more about whether you have IP protection than that letter. You have to get the letter, you have to go to it, but you can help them do the search, because as an inventor, you're a much better person at keywords than 23-year-olds in Manhattan. So be very careful when you're doing this IP. Do the search yourself. And the only one rule is if you don't see anything in there, and you go, Jesus, I'm a genius, it's probably stupid. You will see things, and you have to see things. That's part of, uh, that's part of what is uh, the success issue. Let's talk about the regulatory path. This is a startup for doing chronic total occlusions. I know you're going to talk about some of those things. Um, I started this in, in 2006. Um, in 2007, we started the 510K. I figured a 510K, this ought to be really simple because it's essentially an active guide wire, a guide wire. It's an 18,000 and a 14,000 guide wire. That was in April 2007. So um, we marched along, we did our peripherals, we did our coronaries, here's June 2007, and we did our legs, and I got approval in the end of 2010. Three years to get a 510K. We kept going back to the FDA and they said, well, yeah, thanks for doing those 20 patients. How about doing 40 now? Okay, we'll do 40, any reason? Yeah, we think 40 is a good number. Go back, yeah, how about 80? Finally, after 110 patients, three years later, to get an active guide wire approved, it was uh, a lot of money. Uh, you know, over $10 million went in this company. Now, we transitioned it for 40, um, but, but still, it's a, it, it was an issue, one that I didn't appreciate. The 510 cathway today is very variable. If you change a color of a catheter, you might have a chance. But don't assume your 510K um, is, is, is vetted with common sense. And, and that whole 510K, I'm on the new 510K mission, believe me, it's confusing. So don't take that for granted. Um, again, so, so, so there's just so many predictable unpredictabilities at the FDA. So the one advice I would have is go early to the FDA 
and go often. Form a relationship with the FDA. The FDA are not people that are as vicious as they're made out to be. They need to be included. Even when you're doing European trials, you need to include them in what's being done, and you need to always have a cast of the minutes of interaction with the FDA. That helps because the time constant of a reviewer is about six months, and they're younger than my kids, they seem like. So, so you gotta have that minute clock going every time you interact with them. Let's talk about one last one that, um, it wasn't all my mistake, but it was our team's mistake. Stroke is a huge issue uh, all over the world, um, and, and, and this is a great target, and this is uh, gonna be a big thing in the next decade. Well, this is a very simple device, it's a corkscrew. And this corkscrew goes in and sucks thrombus out uh, from some pretty significant uh, strokes way beyond the time that you would consider giving any of the uh, any of the lytic therapy. And you can see here that it reconstitutes by taking out that uh, that uh, thrombus a very good revascularization. Well, it gets paid extremely well too. Uh, reimbursement is about seventeen thousand. So what's the problem? You've got a simple device. It's a corkscrew. Good patents. Um, we started this in 2000. What's the problem? Why did it take so long? Well, the problem was we didn't look far enough and realize that there's only 200 people that can actually put a corkscrew in the head. So there's 700,000 strokes. It's an integration issue. Always know not only what patients they're going to, but who has the control of the patients. That's a very important aspect of integration. We made this mistake. Uh, you need to know your customers. You need to know how to integrate into hospitals. Now remember, 62% of all the doctors in the United States work for the Kaisers of the world now. They're all fleeing from private practice. So you have to know how the umbrella works too and how Kaiser makes, an ACA, how these big HMOs make decisions. So let me just end by talking about what I do think is gonna be very opportunistic. We already talked about ITMT, we already talked about the globalization of invention all the way to execution. We saw this big structural heart influence, we're gonna hear from Guy in a minute, we heard from Farallon, but what often happens when you're able to put a valve like this in, in 32 minutes to an 82 year old, that disruptive technology spawns a whole of other expansion inventions and companion inventions. Remember, the responsibility of an Edgewards, of a Medtronic, has to be skin to skin. Access, navigation, protection of the head during this. We probably have to get smarter about how we're doing valvuloplasty. Positioning, implant, being able to control the flow, especially in the coronaries. Access and closure of the apex. Remember, that's 40% of all the valves that are going in Europe, and we've got to close. The worst two valve cases that I've ever been in in my life, they exsanguinated with a perfect valve. This is a very important issue. We saw that if you bleed at TCT from either the transfemoral or the transapical root, you die more. So again, these are two areas that I think are gonna be very important. Um, so as you bring up a wire, naturally, and you bring up a catheter, and this is a perfect area to invent, you throw up emboli into the head, right? So simply coming in with something that would be that would be different and somewhat protective would be an important contribution to uh, to this, um, to this uh, again, whole body, if you will, treatment. And, and this is one of several uh, technologies. Um, there's some that just deflect the emboli from going into the head. There's others that actually catch it. And you can see this filter going up in the left carotid. And a little guide maneuver puts another filter in a filter. And now you've got the head completely protected from some of those emboli. Now I think that's gonna be very important because you see these patients come in with bad left ventricles, you don't want them going out with bad left hemispheres. And the incidence of some of the strokes that we're seeing with these aggressive and now gonna be more aggressive because more people are gonna do, more docs are gonna do more patients. We're gonna see this as an area. So if there's one area I think to invent, it's this protection. I think it's large hole closure in the groin. I also think it's being able to access the apex, stabilize and close the apex. Remember, 40% of these valves are being put in through the apex, but also LVADs, also mitrals we're gonna start doing through, um, through, the, um, through the apex. So if we had a way to again, access and stabilize during the port administration of your therapy and be able to close, this is a pretty simple device. If you can open a bottle of wine, you can pretty much get this uh, 
this helical decreasing diameter coil into the apex that snugs the myocardium around, around the tube. You can see it even compresses during the cardiac cycle to sort of stabilize like a shock absorber as you're putting through things in and out of these uh, large, you know, uh, 25 French uh, conduits. Once you're done with the procedure, again, transapical aortic valve treatment is a very quick, a very accurate procedure. The problem is you start suturing through what is meatloaf. And that ends up being, as we saw at TCT, an issue with respect to bleeding. This is simply just a plug that goes in that coil that has already compressed the tissue, and the coil itself closes most of the time. But this is a plug to just ensure it, and, um, and, and if you want to reaccess, you could reaccess this at some point too. Um, and this just completely uh, epithelializes um, over time. And so this is targeted for, uh, for first, in, first in man uh, next quarter at Dr. Walter's place and a couple other uh, uh, surgical implants. So again, I think that's a, a very important issue. Some of the other new challenges, reduce hospitalizations, reduce complications in the hospital. Change things from the OR to the outpatient. Reduce readmission rates. 26% of all Medicare patients in our country get readmitted 30 days after they're discharged. That's a big opportunity to save money. And who are the customers? The customers are the hospitals because they get fined now for having readmission rates. So again, there's a terrific amount of opportunity. Heart failure is an area we really can impact on. Here's a technology from Israel, again, driven out of the, out of the uh, ability to look for soldiers beyond a wall. This essentially looks for fluid in your lungs. It communicates wirelessly to some of those things that we actually care, carry around a lot, and that could be a home monitoring and really help communication with the healthcare, reminders to take your medicine, and decrease that re-hospitalization, which in our country is one of the biggest healthcare causes um, from, uh, from a cost perspective. So, so in conclusion, so be aware of the landscape. There's a bimodal pathway. Decide what hump you're going to be on and understand that there's a discipline and strategic issues that are different at both of those hump specifics. IP with egos don't match. I made that mistake. FDA reality, I made that mistake. Financial expectations always have to be at bay, especially today. The average medical device IPO used to be below $100 million. The average M&A for a medical device is $61 million. So I have all these people running in my office saying I got a billion dollar company. I said, okay, I'm going to lunch. Um, you know, because you got you to put expectations uh, at bay these days. Innovation spawns around disruptions. You're going to see iPhone, iPads, DES, Plavix, and then drug-eluting balloons, TAVI, protection, closure, that sort of thing. Innovation to execution has to be global, and it's become global, so it's important to work worldwide. Thank you very much for your...